Scouts and the church here, we were mentioning it's been 95 years of working together, but also that uh, Scouts has a special place in my heart, as I know of uh, ways in which the Scouts have helped uh, pastors in very difficult situations. There's this great story of how a uh, special charter plane was arranged where a pilot, a pastor, a politician, and a scout all boarded together. And as they were flying over Montana, some great winds struck up, and something happened, and one of the engines failed. And as the plane was tottering around, the pilot did something unexpected. He came into the cabin, and he said to the other three passengers, I have some good news and some bad news. First, the bad news, the plane is going down. But there's only three parachutes. I have a newborn son. I'm taking mine goodbye. And with that, the pilot takes his parachute and jumps out the side of the plane. The other three are looking around, the politician, the priest, or the pastor, and the scout. What are they going to do? They have two parachutes left. So the politician looked at the other two and said, guys, I'm really important. <laughs> he grabs a bag, jumps out the plane, and he's gone. And the pastor is sitting, looking at the young scout and saying, you know, I've had a nice, wonderful life. I know where I'm going. Why don't we take the last parachute? It'll work out. But the scout has a wise word to say. He says to the pastor, Pastor, don't worry. That politician was too busy. He grabbed my backpack. <laughs> and I can figure out how to make this not work for a midget. Well, this morning we hear uh, another part of the Gospel of John. As a church, we've been reading through the Gospel of John listening to the ways in which God's Word applies to us, and also hearing where it is that Jesus meets people in their daily lives. Today's story is not unlike many of the other stories we hear in the Gospel of John. Jesus meets up with another person in the story. This person was a man who was born blind. Somebody from birth who couldn't see. And it was the tradition of that day that if somebody had an ailment, whether they were born blind or if they were crippled or lame, that at a certain age that they would have a place in the city where they would sit every day looking for some money. And as they sat there looking for help or aid, people would pass by. I don't know if you know people who sit around looking for help, asking for aid from time to time. But in Jesus' day, it was common to see that somebody who might have need might be there at the temple courts or there at the front gates in passageways between businesses so that they might ask somebody for assistance. And what do you know, just like today, many people pass by that way. Many people have passed by so often that sometimes those people become invisible to us, don't they? We hear them, we see them, and we begin to ignore them. But Jesus is this really amazing character. He not only sees and knows of where people's hurt and pain is, but he stops and he listens and he cares. So is the situation with this blind man where Jesus in his compassion takes a moment to spend time with this man who was born blind. And as he's looking at him, he begins to talk with him and the disciples have a different kind of question. Now what's interesting about religious people Sometimes we get so uh, wonderfully righteous that we sometimes forget the real practical need. And that the religious people have a question about what's going on with this man. They said, well, the reason he's born blind, is it because of his sin? Is it because of his sin or maybe the sin of someone else, like maybe his parents? Why is this man born blind? Not even paying attention to the fact that this man is looking for help or aid. The religious people are asking the question of a theological nature. Why is this happening? Where is the sin in the story? I think it's interesting when we hear the story because that same question provides today. It keeps perpetuating itself. Because we often ask ourselves the same question, maybe not the same phrase, but we ask the question, whose fault is this? Whose fault is it that this guy is out there looking for help? Is it his fault? Is it his parents' fault? Is it the fact that we live in a society that somehow perpetuates a situation of poverty and injustice? Somehow we sit on the sidelines asking great questions. And I wonder if maybe the motivation here in asking the questions is a, is a way of getting ourselves off the hook. If somehow we can figure out that it's this guy's problem, this guy's fault, we can ignore him. He's no longer on the agenda of something we need to worry about. 
Maybe it's society's problem. And so instead of giving this person any aid, maybe we can figure out some social system in which we can adjust, in which we can help society change. But again, we're back to these theoretical questions that don't seem to make any practical difference in this person's life. Who has sinned? Certainly it was true of that day and age that people thought that sin was directly parallel to suffering in people's lives. If you had sinned somewhere in your life, then you should expect that something bad would happen to you. And you know, it's interesting, because as you travel around the world, we do have the same kind of idea. In uh, the Far East, the concept that sin follows after, uh, or suffering follows after brokenness or sin in one's life is called Wu Wei. You know, and there's this thing that if something bad happens, it's just something part of your fate or your destiny because it's part of your makeup. And so when something bad happens, you might just go, glad that's over, right? Because somehow it's going to be part of the system of suffering that we're all about and to experience. But Jesus has a very different way of approaching this issue. When the disciples ask the question, who had sinned? Whose fault is it that this guy is in poverty? Whose fault is it that he's stuck there by the road looking for help? Whose fault is it? Jesus doesn't go the way of trying to answer that question. Instead, Jesus simply says, this has been given to us the opportunity, an opportunity for us to demonstrate glory to God through this suffering. I'm reminded of this great story of a scoutmaster who had taken some scouts out with him. And of course it was raining. I don't know if you've been on camping trips when it's been raining, right? Not always the happiest of Karens, right? All your gear gets wet, your sleeping bag is heavy, you know, your, your boats get wet, and you start to wonder about how far you got to go before you can stop and find some dry place. Not always the happiest thing. But as the scoutmaster was thinking about this on a long journey to the campsite, he invited the scouts to come around, and he did something for them. He pulled out a pot of water that he put over the fire and been boiling for a period of time. He said, you know, we've been grumbling about our appearance, but I want to show you something and see what you guys learn from this. And so first he took out of his bag some eggs that he carefully had packaged, and he put some eggs into the, into the pot. Then he took out of his bag some carrots, and he put some carrots in the pot. And finally he put in some coffee. And after a while of having it stir around and boil, he asked the scouts, what do you observe? What's going on? And so they took out one of the eggs, and after they cracked it, they noticed that the, the egg had become hard. And after they pulled out the carrots, they noticed that the, the carrots had become soft, but that the water had changed into this brown coffee color. He says, what do we learn about this? And one wise scout said, Scoutmaster, it looks like they all experienced the same trouble, hard water, the boiling water. But they each responded in different ways. One became hard, became tough. The second became soft and wilted. But lastly, the coffee had changed the environment around it. When we think about this situation, the hardness of this person's life, the difficulty in which they were in, Jesus isn't saying uh, that there's some theoretical issue going on. He says this is an opportunity for us to change the world in which we live, an opportunity for us to engage in a way to give glory to God, God to be glorified by what we do in response. Instead of letting those circumstances somehow make us hard, saying we don't care about those people because it's their fault, somehow becoming soft, saying, well, whatever, I'll just give it all away, but rather taking another option, saying because God has given us this opportunity, we can make a difference. We can engage the world around us in a way that changes the circumstances, that changes the issue in which we're facing today. And we can do it. So Jesus encourages the disciple that this opportunity, this man who was born blind, is an opportunity for us to engage and show God's love and mercy. And so he says, while it is still day, we have the obligation to do what is right. While it is still day. Now, Jesus, we know, is, is moving in this direction towards the cross. We know that he's going to Jerusalem, and eventually he's going to die and be crucified on the cross. And he knows that day is to come. But he says, while I am here, while I have breath, I'm going to do the most I can do now. Because this is the day that God has given us to do that good work. Now, what's interesting about our lives is we don't know that day. Jesus may have known exactly when it is that he might have died, but we don't know that day. But we do know that we have been given today. 
We know that we've been given this moment, this opportunity, to do with our lives the most that God has asked us to do. And certainly, like that circumstance, we can choose our response. We can become hard-hearted or we can super soft and, and not care. Or we can people who are willing to engage with what God is doing around us. says, this is the day. While we still have light, while we still have been given breath by God, we have the opportunity to respond with God in the good work that He is going to do. So finally, Jesus shows us His example. The scriptures describe how Jesus is the light. The light that has been given by God into the world as the perfect example of what good life would look like. If God had given us the scriptures and, and helped the people understand what a good life looks like, but it realized that we don't always read so well. We don't always know exactly what it is meant by what it is on the page. And so God came in the very person of Jesus Christ and lived that life for us so that we could see it in the flesh. We could see it lived out in front of us. We could see what it looks like to be a person full of compassion, to live obediently to God, and God's light shone through the very life of Jesus as an example for the world so that we might know what it looks like to please God. We don't have to wonder or look around too many corners to ask the question, what did Jesus do? What did, how did Jesus respond? If we're going to live a good life, I think we can find no better example than Jesus. In Philippians 4, verses 8, it gives us this good suggestion. I think these are characteristics that might help us understand something about this good life. This is from Philippians 4, 8. It says, Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, Whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent and praiseworthy, think about such things. Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put it into practice, and the God of all peace will be with you. You see, like this blind man, many of us live our lives aimlessly walking from one thing to another, stumbling over one mistake to the next. And we begin to wonder sometimes, where is the light in my darkness? Why is it that I keep making the same mistakes over and over and over? Why is it that I feel so stuck and don't seem to have any guidance for my life? To this, Jesus says, I am the light of the world. In the midst of our darkness, God has poured forth his light that we might know something of what God would desire for us. And if we follow after Christ, it says the God of all peace will live with us and will understand something of that peace in our lives as we begin to make a change, a shift from living in our darkness to living into the light. And it's an intentional change. I think part of our, our problem is we recognize that there's been a lot of things that we focus our mind on. Think about the things that you've focused on in the last week. How many of those things have really brought about light in your life? How many of those things have simply continued to close the blinders on a direction for what God would have your life be about? I have nothing against television. But the truth is, most of us spend far too much time watching stupid stuff. And at the end of the day, we wonder, have I learned anything? Have I gained any information? Have I gained any truth or insight into my life? Most of the time, the stuff we've watched has just clouded our vision it's like we've somehow purposefully put cataracts back on our vision and we wonder why it is we are moving around in our darkness. Jesus says, I am the true light that has come into this world. We want to know where it is we might find light, where it is we might find insight into our lives, where we might find the answers to the destruction that's happening within our lives, and we wonder why it is we don't find it. But Jesus is that light. Whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is praiseworthy, whatever is pure, let us focus our minds on that which God has given to us in Jesus. The final act that Jesus provides for this man is a great sign. He reaches ground, down and he grabs the mud from the, from the ground and he spits into it and he makes an interesting paste. Now what's great about mud is everywhere. You don't have to go very far to find mud. In fact, if you were to take your finger along the pew, I bet you'd find some good dust right there. 
In the beginning of the all creation, it said that God reached down and grabbed the same mud. And that he took it in his hands and formed it, and shaped it. And as he shaped us, it says he shaped us in his image. And he breathed his life into this dirt and gave human form and life. I believe what's happening in this story is this man who was born blind, there has never been anyone who was born blind who has gained full sight. Yet Jesus, in the same way that God, who over all creation can form from the dust and make life, He grabbed what was the common stuff, put His Spirit into it, and placed it on the man's eyes, repairing what was broken, so that he could see again. The truth of the matter, of course, is that all of us are born blind. Maybe not physically blind, but we all live in a form of darkness in our lives. We're all in need of repair. We're all in need of healing. We're all in need of seeing God in a new way because we recognize that the darkness in which we live is prevailing. And we need to be born again. To be made new in His image. This morning, I wonder if you might take a moment to think for yourself. Where is it that you're experiencing that darkness? Where is it that you need to be reformed? Where is it that you are calling out to God to clear up your vision? To clean up your life? The desire to be made again, to be made in His image. Because too often we find ourselves sitting in this theoretical chair and wondering some great wonderful questions about how the world works but Jesus has stepped in from that darkness and has offered to us new life. That we might be made again. That we might live into that fullness of the light that He has called us to be about. This morning, I can invite you, if you are interested, if you recognize that there is a place in your life where you need to be made again, you recognize there is a spiritual blindness that needs to be cleared up, then you might come forward this morning as we turn to our time in prayer. And as you come forward, just take a piece of this mud. Use it as you will, as a reminder of God's healing work. That God might bless you. That this might be a way of reminding us of being born again. Being made afresh. Being able to see in the darkness of our lives. That we might live a fresh freedom. Let us pray. Lord God, we thank you that you have called us out of the darkness that you have poured into this darkness your very Son, Jesus Christ, that He is the light of the world. God, we confess together that too often we have so much appreciated our own darkness that we have forgotten even what your word would say. But we know we need to be made again. Lord, this morning as we come and praise and worship, we ask, Lord, that you would pour out your Holy Spirit on us as we gather. That you might... Use the elements that are here that we might be made new. That you might repair what is broken in us. That we might be made new in you. All this in Jesus' name. Amen.